Well, hello and welcome. Plugin America presents the webinar, Public and Fleet Charging Stations, an introduction for site planners. Our presenters are Tom Saxton and Chad Schwitters from Plugin America. So uh, let's get started. Our first presenter is Tom Saxton. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Tom here. He, is, he has degrees in math and physics and works as a software uh, design engineer. Tom has been an electric vehicle supporter since 2006 and an owner since 2008. He is actively involved with the broad electric vehicle community from showing the practicality of a 2002 Toyota RAV4 EV at grocery stores to demonstrating the performance of a Tesla Roadster at drag race tracks. He works with local municipalities and businesses interested in building effective and cost efficient Oh, golly, cost-efficient electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So let's hear what Tom has to say. Uh, thanks, Dave. Let's, uh, let's get rolling with uh, level one charging, which is slow but cheap, and I, I think it's often the most uh, underrated type of charging. So let's, uh, let's talk about what it is and uh, when it's cool. So level one charging means just charging from a normal uh, household outlet, 120 volts, typically on a 15 amp circuit, which means you can draw 12 amps. Uh, a slightly uh, modified version of that is uh, an outlet. You may have seen these around. It's got the funny little horizontal doodad there on the plug. And what that means, it's on a 20 amp circuit, which means you can draw 16 amps, so just a little bit more power than a regular household outlet, but still a pretty common type of outlet and also very inexpensive. And so if you're charging from this uh, type of power connection, you know, what's the charge rate? Well, in a, in a Chevy Volt or a Nissan Leaf, you basically get about four miles of range per hour, which sounds pretty horrible it, it, until you think about how, how much that adds up overnight. So if your car stays parked for 10 hours, that means uh, Chevy Volt would be able to get completely full, get a full charge in about, in about that 10 hours. Uh, a Nissan Leaf could get that same 40 miles in 10 hours, or if it sets for a full day, you can actually fill it all the way up. Uh, Tesla Roadster can actually uh, charge at a little higher rate, so it can get up to 16 amps, but it's a little more power hungry. so. A Roadster will pick up between three and five miles, depending on which sort of outlet you're plugged into, which that means it'll take between 47 and 72 hours to get a full charge. But again, you're going to get that same, you know, say 30 to 50 miles of range in an overnight charge, which for most drivers in the U.S., that's enough to actually do your, your daily driving. So when is that useful? Well, if you're going to just stop at a fast food restaurant for 30 minutes, you're only going to pick up about two and a half miles, and that's not uh, likely to be very useful. If you're in a you know a restaurant where you're going to spend an hour and a half eating a meal, you could pick up seven and a half miles. And again, that's probably not going to make the difference between you being able to make the round trip from home to the restaurant and back. Uh, you know, if you're going to spend three hours watching a movie at a mall, it gets a little more interesting. But uh, to me, it starts to get interesting at places where you're going to be spending at least eight or ten hours. So at a hotel or a bed and breakfast, get an overnight charge, you can get 40 miles. And that can actually be you know, all you need if you're just doing a trip up the coast or something and stopping at B&Bs as you go. Likewise, if you, uh, if you can charge at work and pick up 40 miles, then that makes a lot of trips uh, much more possible and interesting. So a Chevy Volt that has about a 40-mile range, if you can charge at home and at work, that means you could actually live 40 miles from work and still do the whole round trip on electric power. And you know, with a Leaf, it also makes it a lot more practical to do a little longer, a longer drive while maintaining a, uh, a nice, healthy comfort zone there. At home, your car's probably parked for 12 hours, so you can pick up 60 miles. That's cool. And then by the time you start thinking about airport parking, you know, typically if you park at an airport, you're going to be there for at least a day. And, you know, for most trips, you're probably going to be gone for several days. 
And in that, uh, in that period of time, you can get a full charge in not only a lead for a Volt, but even in a Tesla Roadster with the big 240-mile range. So uh, level one charging at airports is awesome. Likewise, a resort where you're going to park your car and then just leave it for a few days, again, level one will be completely adequate. Uh, actually, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I did a 450-mile trip. We uh, were island hopping through the San Juan Islands in Washington and then popped up to Vancouver Island. We spent seven days. We were only driving you know, between 10 and 30 or 40 miles a day, typically. And it, it just happened to work out that we were able to do all of our charging just at uh, regular 110 outlets. And the photo here shows us charging our Roadster at a yurt out in the boonies on Vancouver Island. And we were 45 miles from the nearest gas station, and yet we had no problem charging up our car uh, using just a, a completely ordinary household outlet. So that worked great for us. So now, what does this cost a site owner? If you're going to supply level one charging for employees or customers, what's the, what's the electric bill going to look at? Look? Well, if you, if you do the math, 120 volts times 12 amps is uh, 1.44 kilowatts and the average electric rate in the US is 11 cents per kilowatt hour so that means for every hour that a car is hooked up to an ordinary outlet they're drawing about 16 cents worth of electricity so those overnight charges at the B&B's that we did where we charged for 10 hours or so uh, we used about a dollar sixty worth of electricity from those places so the, the the cost of letting people charge is very small, especially if they're, you know, spending a hundred or two hundred dollars to stay at your bed and breakfast. But likewise, you know, for employees, that might be, you know, less than you're paying giving them free soda. So it's really a very modest cost. Uh, there are a few downsides, though. Uh, typically, an electric vehicle is going to need to have some fancy cord that they plug into a 110 outlet and into their car for reasons that cause a lot of us some exasperation. Uh, electric cars don't just have regular extension cords on them, so we, we have to use an expensive cord that's used, usually worth a few hundred dollars. So if I'm doing level one charging, that cord's just out there dangling. So I'm not going to be very happy about that if I don't feel fairly safe in that, in, you know, wherever I'm parking. Obviously, to B&B, &B, that's fine. Even in an airport parking lot, I wouldn't be too concerned but it's something to think about. Uh, because we're not hooked up to any infrastructure, that means that the owner's not going to be able to get uh, any sort of notices from the car or from the charging station, although uh, both the LEAF and the VOLT can send messages to the owner if the charge is interrupted directly from the car, so that's not an issue there. And uh, again, since you're not part of the charging network, if you want your uh, charging stations to be added to the charging maps, then you're probably going to have to go to a little bit of work to, to make that happen. So uh, level two is sort of the next step up. Uh, level two means charging from 240 volts, and that generally requires uh, a charging station that uh, adds some safety to the circuitry. Basically what it does is it doesn't send power to the end of the cable until it knows that it's connected to an electric vehicle, and that way you can't have you know, somebody getting a shock accidentally. And uh, this photo shows examples of three different types of uh, charging stations. So with level two charging, uh, a Chevy Volt can pick up about 10 miles of range per hour of charging, which means it will get a, a full charge in about four hours. A Nissan LEAF will pick up about 12 um, miles of range per hour, and so that means it can pick up a full charge in eight hours. And, you know, eight hours is a long time, but for the most part, people aren't going to be arriving at a charging station with an empty battery. So, you know, even a couple of hours or three hours may get them back up to full and, and also offers uh, plenty of opportunity for, you know, extending the range of their vehicle even if they don't get all the way up to a full charge. Uh, Tesla Roadster can actually accept a pretty wide range of power from level two stations, anything from 16 amps to 70 amps, which allows it to pick up anything from 13 miles of range to 61 miles of range per hour of charging. And although Tesla Roadsters are super rare, I expect 
over the next several years that there will be other vehicles that will allow charging at rates that are faster than what the LEAF and the Volt allow now. So, you know, probably starting with the Tesla's Model S, that'll be another vehicle which will be able to charge quickly at a level two station if it supports the, the high enough current level. So if you're using uh, level two at home, if you're, uh, if you're using 15 amps, that's what the LEAF and the Volt can take advantage of. They get, you know, 10 to 12 uh, miles of range per hour of charging and an eight hour charge will uh, go up to 100 miles if the vehicle supports that far. And uh, with 30 amps, you can actually uh, charge up a 200 mile range battery. And at the full 80 amps, that is the maximum that level two allows, you can actually get up to 70 miles of range per hour. So you can get a full charge in, you know, much less than eight hours for any of the vehicles that are either on the road or being talked about at the moment. So let's suppose you're a municipal manager and you're considering putting in level two charging. Uh, you know, I think it's in, when you're choosing what sort of equipment you want to install, it's important to carefully think through the issues. So for example, what's the goal of putting in charging? I'm guessing for most municipalities, this is not uh, being used as, a, way, as a, a revenue stream, as a way to fill the city's coffers by selling electricity. I hope that's not your plan because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to be very lucrative. If your goal is to encourage owners to use electric vehicles and introduce them to the notion that electric vehicles are around and, uh, and that they should feel comfortable about being able to drive knowing that there will be opportunities to charge if they happen to get low, then you want to do <clears throat> excuse me, you want to do everything you can to make those charging stations accessible and appealing. And so you'll want to think about those when you're considering whether or not you want to bill for charging. If you're if uh, folks in your town are charging at home at say 30 cents an hour, then they're not going to be very excited about using a charging station at City Hall that charges two and a half dollars an hour. So if you want those charging stations to be used, you want to think about, you know, being at a, a price point that makes sense. And then the next thing is where do you locate the charging stations? You, you know, you want to put them in a place where they'll be visible, but you also want to make sure that they're not blocked by uh, gas cars. So if you put it right there at the front door to City Hall, then uh, people are going to be either very tempted to block those locations with their gas car because it's a great place to park, or they're going to be resentful if they see that empty space there not getting used because there's not an electric vehicle charging there at the moment. So for those reasons, you want to think about where you put the spaces and put them in places where they'll be visible, but where they won't be. <coughs> Uh, displacing gas cars. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what about the cost of supplying level two charging? Well, a, a lead for a bolt plugged into a level two charger will use about 36 cents worth of electricity per hour, assuming you're paying the national average of 11 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, soon there'll be some vehicles that'll charge at twice that rate. The 2012 Ford Focus and also the 2012 Nissan Leaf are expected to double the charge rate, which means they can draw about 73 cents per hour. And a Tesla Roadster, if you have a charging station that'll supply the full 70 amps that a Tesla Roadster can take, then you're going to be giving away a dollar 85 per hour. And so, uh, so those are the those are the costs. And again, you know, people probably are not going to show up at your charge station with an empty battery and need to sit there for eight hours to charge all the way up. So, you know, most charging will maybe be an hour or two. So you're looking at typically small multiples of that hourly charge. And uh, that's uh, that concludes my talk about uh, level one charging and the municipal level two charging. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Our next presenter is Chad Switters. 
He happens to be the vice president of Plugin America. Uh, Chad is a former mobile software executive and technology evangelist. He and his wife both drive electric vehicles powered by the wind. They also have a plug-in hybrid that their college-age children share. He has taken a 3,000-mile trip in an electric vehicle, so he knows firsthand the value of well-placed chargers. Like Tom, he has helped to install charging infrastructure. So why don't you tell us some more, Chad? Thank you, Dave. I'm going to kind of pick up where Tom left off, and I'm going to continue with level two, uh, but I'm going to address specifically commercial cases. So unlike home or, say, a fleet, where the cost of the charger is really considered as part of the cost of the car. Um, if you are a business and you are going to offer a charger for your customers to use, uh, now the big difference here is you need to come up with some sort of business case of why you're going to do this. And a couple things that uh, we've learned from surveying electric vehicle drivers is almost all charging is done at home. 88% is at home and 7% is at work. Uh, no surprise, those are places where people park for a long time anyway. That only leaves 5% of charging that's somewhere else. So if you're offering a charger and you hope your customers will be using it, you're going to have to be someplace convenient to fit into that 5%. And as Tom was pointing out, with the amount of electricity that is typically dispensed in one of these charging sessions, users are going to expect it to be cheap. Now I'm, I'm going to be saying a bunch of things, don't do this, don't do that. Before we go there, though, before I get too negative, uh, I, I want to show you that this can be done, and it's not hard, and it's not expensive. Uh, this is an example of some charging stations in front of a mall in California, and you can see from these uh, green boxes here that they already have their power here. They located the charging stations right next to the power, and in fact, it looks like they didn't even trench. They may have run the, the cables and then poured cement over them, uh, so this was pretty cheap to get them into the ground. Uh, it looks like they're not paying for any network services. It looks like these are standalone stations. They stuck up a couple signs and painted lines, but now it's very clear to gas drivers that they're not supposed to park there. But there's multiple places for electric vehicle drivers to park and to use the stations, including the ones in the back, where they can park back there, even if the other ones happen to be full for some reason. Um, and it's not right up front, so it's not making the gas car drivers angry, but it's you know, looks like it's at a nice mall where people's going to want to go and spend time anyway. Uh, I'd be real happy to use this in my electric car. So the business case for an EVSE, which is an electric vehicle uh, charging, st it's another word for a charging station. Uh, it's not. Some people call it a charger. It's not really a charger. Technically, the charger is in the car, uh, but it's not a big deal. We can call it a charger if we want. Uh, we typically call it charging station. So in order to justify a charging station, like pretty much anything else you do in business, you want to maximize your total benefits and minimize your costs, and hopefully the benefits will be greater than the cost. So some of the benefits from having a charging station in front of your business, uh, one is obviously you can collect fees from the people who are using it for charging. Um, while people are sitting there charging, you basically have a captive customer. So they may be shopping at your place of business and they may also be paying parking fees if it's a pay lot that they're in. You can also put advertising on the charging station. Sometimes it's just stickers stuck on the box. Uh, other times they've got screens and you can target it at the specific customers. You already know they drive the EV. If it's on some sort of charging station network where they use a car to log in, you know who they are, which car they've got, where they charged last, you can know a whole bunch about them, and that can actually be uh, a pretty valuable advertising medium. And then, of course, there's always just customer and employee goodwill. A lot of people are happy to see businesses that are offering this sort of services for their customers. Now, some of these are hard to evaluate. It's hard to say how many people are going to charge there, how much will they pay, how long would they sit there charging, how much are they going to spend at your place of business, you know, how much are you going to get for the advertising impressions. So it's hard to do, but at least it's straightforward, the sort of things you're supposed to be looking at. Now as for costs, you've got basically two types. The startup costs, you've got to purchase the charging station and you've got to install it. And uh, there's a bunch of play in that. As Tom mentioned, there's different types of stations and obviously there's different types of installations. So the, the worst thing, the most expensive thing is if you've got to dig a big trench across the parking lot. 
so location of where you're putting the stations is one of the biggest things uh, affecting the initial cost. Then for ongoing cost, uh, maintenance, service, billing, electricity, as Tom pointed out, the electricity cost itself is awful cheap. If you are charging fees, uh, you may have costs for billing, you know, maybe you'll have your employers doing it or maybe you'll be using a network service uh, that came with the brand of charging station that you bought. Um, as for maintenance, I mean, there's not much to these. They're really an outlet with a little bit of safety equipment on it. Uh, probably the biggest cost is really uh, vandalism, uh, which is another reason why you might want to consider location to put it in some place where uh, it's, it's visible. So when I say consumers love cheap, you know, exactly how cheap am I talking? I'm just going to kind of quickly run through some of the numbers. Some of these are familiar from what Tom was just saying. Uh, but the Leaf and Volt, which are the most popular cars out there right now, they charge awful slow and the electricity is awful cheap. So your typical hour, you're only talking about 38 cents worth of electricity and that's enough to push the car about 10 miles. Now if they were to not drive their EV and instead drive their gas car and they were to buy a gallon of gas, you know, they can go 10 miles for less than two dollars. And one of the biggest reasons that people switch from gasoline to electricity is because electricity is so much cheaper than gasoline. So if you are charging a rate where the EV driver is going to be paying more for electricity than gasoline, some of them are actually going to be kind of hostile towards it. Um, some of them will still pay it if they really need it, uh, but if you were hoping for customer goodwill, uh, that's certainly a consideration. Now some of this is going to change in the future. Um, cars will come out with faster chargers in the car, although the if you are using any of the DOE funds, which is almost all the grants out there right now, uh, there's a bunch of companies that are in many cases giving away chargers if you install it, uh, but that's coming from Department of Energy funds and they have a restriction that you can't put in more than a 30 amp circuit. Uh, which I'll get into more on that later. But so no matter what car they come up with, they can't pull more than 30 amps. So it can't be more than 76 cents an hour. So charging fees for people to charge, it's, it's an obvious thing to do. And in principle, I've got absolutely nothing against it. I'm happy to pay for my electricity. And if somebody's providing it for me, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, compensate them for what they've done. But some of the problems that we've discovered when this happened 10 years ago in California, the first thing is you can't count on the money. If you install a charging station and you have, say, a $2 an hour fee, somebody else could install one nearby and it's only $1 an hour or maybe even free. Even if no competitors come along, the one thing we do know, the one thing I can guarantee you is if you have a, char a free charging station and you start charging a fee for it, it's going to get used less. It's only going to be used by the people that really need that charge. But if it's used less, then all of the other benefits, all of the customer and employee goodwill and the captive customers and the advertising, all that happens less too. So now you're more dependent on these fees. But as we've discussed with these small margins, the small amount of electricity you're giving them out and the small amount of overhead you can tack onto it, it just really makes it almost impossible to just charge a fee and make your money back. So I actually think in most cases, not all, but in most cases, free charging is going to be cheaper, it's going to be safer because you're not going to have competitors undercutting you, and it's going to bring more overall benefits to your businesses. So I'd say that's where you should start. You should start looking at can we get enough benefit from offering a free charging station? And then if you think you can't, then you can look at charging fees. Um, here are some example cases where fees may make sense. I mean, obviously, if none of the other benefits don't apply, for example, you're the state and you're putting in a charging station in a rest area, and by law, you can't have any advertising and there's no services that people can spend money on. So in a case like that, the only way to get your money is to charge fees, and, and then that makes sense. Um, if you're in a really remote area and there's no possibility for competition, but you're sure people are going to be driving their EVs through here, and they're going to need you to get to the next city, then that makes sense too. Although I think the most common case and the place where I think fees are really helpful and a very good idea is when you want or need to limit use. Uh, for example, if every day all of your charging stations are in use but you can't anymore, say you don't have an, a big enough electrical panel or you don't have the parking spaces or something like that. If you change it from free and start adding a fee, 
again, the one thing we know is they'll get used less. So that helps make sure that they're available for the people that really need them. Uh, another example would be, you know, you're in the middle of a big city and you don't have very many parking spots and just by the location of electricity, they're in a prime area. There may be some electric vehicle drivers that go in and plug in just in order to get the good parking spots. And if you want to discourage that, you can charge fees. And again, you're likely then to only get the people that really need the charging. And sometimes the thing about commercial chargers, they're typically used during the day, whereas most EVs, most charging happens at night. Uh, at night is really good. Typically, the electricity is cleaner, and typically the utility has a lot of excess capacity. Uh, some utilities in some areas charge extra during the middle of the day. If you're putting a big draw on the system um, or if you're going over a certain amount, they may charge you some kind of high fees. And this is another place where you can help to limit the use and make sure people aren't uh, drawing electricity at a bad time for the utility, which is also a bad time for your business because of these fees. Now, assuming you've got the pricing worked out, still remember there's only 5% of the charging happening in these places, it's still got to be something convenient. Um, so ideally, it will be somewhere that's accessible and easy to get to. Uh, the charger will be reliable and always work when they get there. It's going to be fast enough and it's got to be located suitably. Some places are going to go anyway is, is the biggest thing. So I'll go into these uh, one by one briefly. Uh, first on accessibility, one thing I'd like to point out is that a charging station that you can't use is really worse than no charging station at all. If I don't think there's a charging station and I can't make it without a charge, I'm not going to take the trip. I'll take my gas car instead. But if I think there's a charging station and I think I'm going to be able to use it and I go there and I try and use it, but it's, for some reason I can't use it, the most common reason is there's a gas car parked there. Uh, that can ruin my whole day. Uh, so when you're installing it, uh, try and put it in a safe area with good signs and lights to make sure they can find it and get there. Uh, try and allow 24-7 access so it's not in a parking lot that gets closed off in the middle of the night. But if somebody needs to charge in the middle of the night, that's a really bad time to find out they can't get to a charging station. Um, and one of the biggest, most important things is to make sure gas cars can't park there. If you've got multiple sites, you know it's okay to let them park in some of them. Just try and make sure at least one is free, and you may need to adjust the number depending on how often the charging stations are used. Um, and if you are charging fees for this, uh, you can also use uh, network services from a lot of the charging station vendors, and they'll charge the fees for you, and that makes it work after hours when your business is not open. Uh, here's an example of somebody that is providing a charging station for their customers. It's a Nissan dealer. They sell electric cars, they install charging stations, they want their customers to charge up. It's perfect, except for that white car is blocking the driveway. This dealership is closed and customers can't go in there and park. And I'd really question why they bothered putting them there rather than somewhere else. Um, because. Again, if you, if you can't count on it, it's worse than not having one. So, uh, please try and put one somewhere where people can get to them. Um, and of course, once you get to it, it's still got to be working. Again, same principle. If you get there and you can't use it, for whatever the reason is, it's worse than not having it at all. Um, so part of this is down to location and putting it in a place where you know maybe employees can monitor it. But sometimes you can't do that. It's off in a remote parking lot or something. So then you might, again, consider network services that come from the charging station vendors. And so they can monitor it. They can make sure that it's working properly. They can tell whether it's in use or not. Uh, they can tell if it's been vandalized. If it has, they can come out and fix it quickly for you. And another reason for these network services is if you're getting one of the free chargers through one of the Department of Energy grants, you may have to do this uh, because it's part of a reporting rule that the DOE is uh, imposing on the people that get these. Although in that case, usually it means the network services are actually free to your businesses for the time period that they've imposed the reporting, which in the ones around here, I believe is three years. So I think for three years, you can get the free network services. And then after that, you'll have to negotiate and see whether it's still worth having or not. Now charging speed. Tom's already gone through several numbers with both level one and level two. I just want to kind of point out from the point of view of the EV driver, they want, you know, they're not trying to get their battery to a certain level. They're trying to drive somewhere. 
And so if they're at your business, the amount of charge they want is what they need to get to the next place, whether it's home or work or wherever they're going. And of course, they don't want to sit around and wait for it. Nobody wants to sit around and charge. You want it to happen while you're doing something else. So the speed at which it charges really can matter in some cases. And uh, the way I think a lot of EV drivers think about it is in terms of miles per hour. How many miles of charger do, charge do I get for every hour that I'm sitting there parked at the charging station? Now, to the extent that you can, if you've got faster charging, First of all, you're going to attract more customers because they're going to rather charge faster at your place than somewhere else. And second of all, the customers there may turn over faster. So you'll get more people, so you get you know, more of the benefits of uh, advertising and captive customers and things like that. Now, the possible restrictions here are, once again, if you're getting the free chargers through a Department of Energy grant, they only allow you to go up to 30 amps, which to me is pretty silly because the entire reason for putting in charging stations is to take away the one disadvantage of cars and it's the refueling issue and it's the refueling time that's a problem and why they restrict it to a certain rate I don't know but they have so what you might want to do if you are restricted to 30 amps for now is at least run some heavier wire or at least put in some thicker conduit I mean that's pretty much free to do so you can run thicker wire later and that way when the DOE grant runs out you may well want to uh, run some heavier wire and put in a bigger breaker and offer a faster charging service. And here's just some more examples similar to what Tom was talking about. Uh, you know, this is comparing 30 amps, which is a DOE restriction, to 75 amps, which is something that the only car on the market at the time DOE imposed these rules could charge at, and the difference in miles you get as you're parked at one of these places. Now, if, as Tom was pointing out, if you're parked all day, at work or overnight at a hotel or something. The amount here is so huge that this typically isn't going to matter. If you're a hotel, you don't really have to worry about faster charging. 30 amps is fine. Uh, but if you are a coffee shop or a restaurant or a mall or something like that, uh, this can make a big difference to people in and whether they can make the trip or not. Although there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns. Um, some people with smaller amount will be fine. Some people it won't. So I think one of the guiding principles is just what's in your electrical panel. You know, if all you can do is put in 40 amp breakers for 30 amp circuits, then that's fine, go with that. But if you've got the room for it, you might as well stick in some bigger ones and uh, you'll attract a few more people that way. And as for the location, uh, once again, considering it from the point of the EV driver, they're only going to use a place well, first of all, if they need the charge. So someplace really close to home, you know, the post office, the video store, the library, usually those are just a few miles away from home. You know, you either just came from home or you're just going back and you can get the charge freer and easier, cheaper and easier at home. So why would you even bother? So places that are further away, which is more likely to be a workplace or an airport or a destination resort, some places like that makes more sense to have a charger. And even if it's there, it's you know to be desirable to make the EV driver actually go to the trouble of finding the spot and plugging into it. I mean, the visit's got to be long enough. And again, if it's someplace they're just in and out, you know, the dry cleaner or the post office or a video store, it doesn't really make sense. They're not going to bother hooking up there. But someplace where they spend more time, workplace, airport, hotel, restaurant, those are long enough where you can get a significant number of miles. So. These guidelines are just to kind of get you thinking about, am I really the right spot? How many benefits am I going to get? How many people are going to be plugging in here? And you've got to look at your location to help figure that, that out. So that's it. That's all for level two anyway. Now I'm going to go to what some people call level three. Technically, that's not correct. It's really called DC fast charging. And uh, this is the thing that can kind of be a game changer. This can make fueling up an electric car be more similar to uh, going to a gas station. Um, now this one, unlike level two, uh, which is really just a safe power outlet, this is a real charger. So it's got more stuff inside. So it's bigger, it's more expensive, uh, it requires bigger hookups, but it can do more. A LEAF can get an 80% fill up in 25 minutes at one of these stations. Now this is clearly not something you're going to use at home. Uh, right now, they are like thirty to $60,000 installed. Um, prices 
appear to be dropping rapidly. Just recently there was somebody announcing one. Uh, the station was like 4,000, I think, or something like that. Installation would still be high. Um, it can be hard in the battery if it's done often, although most manufacturers seem to say, you know, once a day is no big deal. Uh, but you don't want to do it, you know, a couple times a day, every day. Uh, and it requires commercial level power, so you've got to have a 480 volt supply. So different places where you might use something like this. Uh, the initial ones, again, using some Department of Energy funding, are primarily meant for city-to-city -city freeway travel. Uh, so these are being installed between cities like, say, Seattle and Tacoma, where you know it might be an awful stretch for the EV without a charge, but this is a way where they can just stop somewhere in the middle and get a, get a quick charge and be on their way. Um, it can also make sense for places like fleets. If you've got taxis that you want to have out on the road most of the time and you want to um, just have them come in and quickly be able to get back out on the road, uh, they're in use there in some places. Um, if you have a swap station and you're actually swapping batteries and you don't want to have a high inventory of batteries that are slowly charging in the background, it may make sense to have the, the fast chargers as well. And uh, people who live in city and don't have a garage and can't install their own charging station, uh, those people may like to get a charge from one of these occasionally. But primarily right now, it's, it's think of it as a, something enabling freeway travel for electric vehicles. So a business case, if you are thinking, well, I might be a good location for one of these things, some of the differences from the level two case that we were discussing earlier. Uh, one is those captive customers that you're trying to get, which typically in level two is the biggest benefit overall. They aren't going to be around nearly as long, so they're probably not going to be watching a movie. Uh, they may not be eating a very big involved meal. But the advantage is you can turn them over faster. So you're getting more people, but you're getting them for less time. So it, kind of depends on what you're selling and how much business you think you're going to get out of that. Uh, it's obviously going to cost more to install. The purchase is significantly more and uh, installation probably will be too, although it depends on how your panel is set up. Um, the power levels, the energy level is the same. The amount of energy that you're putting into one of the cars that stops there is the same, but the power is higher and some utilities again it depends on time of day and what their capacity is they may charge you more for that so some of your operating costs might be a little higher now because it's more convenient you may be able to justify a higher fee if you are charging people for this electricity but again it's going to be hard to go really high because it's the same amount of energy it's still I mean a Nissan Leaf only holds maybe three dollars worth of electricity and uh, they're going to be kind of upset about paying $20 for it. So I think where this is most likely to work is where customers are really high value uh, for goods or advertising. If you've got something they can get in and buy in 25 minutes, copy's probably not good enough. Um, this is a new model. This isn't something we have experience with in California, unlike the level two charging. Uh, so you may want to take a little bit of time and, and think about this one. Uh, but the way it's working right now with the DOE uh, programs in like Washington and Oregon, uh, basically the charging station company is taking pretty much all the risk and doing pretty much all the work. Uh, you're largely just handing over a plot of land and uh, they're managing everything on it for five to 25 years and then they're giving you a certain percentage of the money. So it's, it's gonna be low reward perhaps, but it's also very low risk for you. Now, if you're thinking about putting one in, of course, the question is, what type? Uh, there are two types you might want to think of. One is the Japanese standard. It has a TEPCO connector, and it uses the Chidemo protocol for the charger to talk to the car. Uh, that can be up to 500 volts and up to 125 25 amps. And so that's 60, over 62 kilowatts. And if we figure in the EV driver's you know, mile per hour thing, that's like 200 miles per hour. You sit there for an hour and you could get 200 miles of range. Uh, this is starting to be seriously interesting for road trips. Uh, this standard is used by Nissan. So most of the Leafs being delivered have this on it. Uh, Mitsubishi soon will be delivering their I, and that will also have this on it. Toyota is supporting the standard, but supposedly only in the Japanese market. So this isn't a worldwide standard. There are nevertheless 
uh, several being sold in other places. Uh, a lot of Northern Europe, I think, is getting a whole bunch of these. Uh, there's a picture of the connector. As you can tell from the person's hand, it's actually a pretty big connector. Now the quote-unquote competing standard, the US standard, unfortunately doesn't really exist yet. Uh, the SAE is working on a proposal and what they're trying to do is modify the existing J1772 connector. Now that's only 240 volt and so it's really just adding more lines inside the connector and so you know, you're not plugging one into the other really so it doesn't have to be the same connector but they're doing this so the auto manufacturers can have just a single port on the car and you know trying to make the packaging a little smaller and more attractive. Uh, the standard also is a little higher both on voltage at 600 volts and current up to 400 amps so now you can be up to 800 miles an hour assuming the car supports it which right now no cars do. Uh, GM and Ford are supporting the standard and uh, trying to make it a no global standard. Uh, some of the European automakers are following it, but kind of waiting to see how things shake out. Uh, the standard's not done yet, and then it's going to take a while for equipment to be built. We're kind of expecting the equipment to be ready maybe late 2012. Uh, if you are considering using any of the DOE grant money, uh, right now a lot of that expires in 2011. If you're buying anything in 2011, there are no SAE charges. So all of the DC fast charge installations that are going in now are going to be the Japanese standard. And there will be hundreds of these installed in a bunch of the states that are in part of the uh, early release DOE program. So what happens if SAE comes out with a new unit later? Um, most people seem to be thinking the DOE somehow or another is going to end up paying for upgrades. Um, but hopefully it's going to be a backwards compatible upgrade. Maybe some of the DC fast charge stations have two cables and one side they could leave with the TEPCO connector and one side they could put the SAE connector because by then we expect about 20,000 Japanese cars uh, to have the TEPCO connectors on them and it's not easy to upgrade the cars. So if you don't want to strand those you'll probably end up having charging stations with both. Or maybe by then there'll be enough cars using them it'll be justifiable to put in new stations. The old stations will be TEPCO and the new stations will be SAE. Uh, no one's really sure how this is going to shake out because if the SAE takes too long, the Japanese standard may win you know, just by being there first and having everybody using it. So we'll see. Interesting times. Um, now just a couple random things, just some pictures. Again, if you want people to use your charging station, they have to find your charging station and a lot of times your city or county or whoever you're working with will put up some of these wayfaring signs to get them to your parking lot. Um, this, this is actually, they recently got approval from the federal government to change this sign a little bit so it looks a little less like a gas station now and they've recently added a plug on the end so it's a little more obvious that it's for electric cars. Um, inside the lot uh, these are some recommended signs to have near the charging station to make sure gas cars aren't parking there. And if you want to limit the amount of time that electric cars are in the spot, you can actually add this green sign too. Um, here's some signage I saw in downtown Portland. Uh, I stared at it for about a minute and then went and parked in a parking garage somewhere else just because it was easier to understand what I had to do. Uh, this is in Redmond, Washington. This is a city parking garage and they've got uh, just level one outlets in here. And these little tiny yellow stickers happen to say you can't park here unless you're an electric car that's going to charge up. But as you can tell by the cars parked there, uh, nobody's paying any attention. The signage just isn't big enough and obvious enough. Um, here's kind of a curious case. It's really nice that this uh, hotel in Woodenville offers a charging station uh, for their customers but it's kind of strange that they put it in a handicapped only spot. And that's all I've got. Well, okay. Thanks a lot, Chad. Uh, next we'll be addressing your questions. Uh, we've got quite a few questions from the audience. And um, our first question is, will slides be sent to the attendees? And we have not discussed that. However, uh, we are planning to provide a recording, uh, basically a video recording of this whole uh, session. So you'll be able to look at it later or share it with, uh, with colleagues. And we'll, we'll discuss uh, the possibility of providing the slides. 
Uh, another question. Um, somebody asked about uh, uh, level two at 80 amps versus DC fast charts, the pros and cons of all that. Uh, uh, Tom, could you uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that? Tell us your thoughts. Uh, sure. Obviously, DC fast charge is uh, faster charging if your car supports it. Uh, level 2 at 80 amps, uh, I find to be pretty adequate for doing road trips. You know, in a, in a Tesla Roadster that has about a 240-mile range, I've done <clears throat> almost 400 miles in a single day on, a, uh, on those high level 2 charging stations. So that makes things pretty nice, and it's a lot cheaper. You know, a level 2 station that supports... Uh, 75 amps, you can get those for, say, $2,000 to $3,000, whereas we're seeing DC quick charge stations being, in, until recently, they were announced at $20,000 to $30,000, although Nissan just last week announced uh, pricing on a, a Nissan-branded station that would only be about ten grand. But still, it's a lot cheaper and easier for a lot of sites to support the, the top end of level two as opposed to the DC quick charge. Okay, thanks. Um, well, on to power consumption concerns. Uh, somebody was asking about a charge point station and wondered, uh, well, while it's sitting there not used and the lights are on and it's talking to the, the wireless network and all that, well, what what is the power consumption? And also, also take into account the lighting you need around the area for safety. Uh, uh, Chad, uh, do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, for the lighting, hopefully you can put it in a parking lot or something that's that's already lit, and so it's not extra lighting for it. I mean, obviously you've got to look at where you're installing it and whether that makes sense or not. Um, the charge, or excuse me, the amount of current that an unused charging station uses varies a great deal by the vendor. Uh, this is one question we've been asking of the vendors, and some of them have paid a lot of attention to it, and most things shut down, and it's just a tiny draw that you'll never notice. Some of them are kind of ridiculously big for just sitting there doing nothing, um, but it's still, you know, if you're looking at your electric bill, you know, it's it's probably going to be under a penny an hour still. Okay. Well, I have another one for you, Chad. Um, somebody's asking about what government incentives there are. Now, I know you've talked, you've mentioned a little bit about a DOE program, but uh, there may be some other incentives. What can you tell us about that? Well, there is a, for businesses, there is a 30% federal credit on installation. And I believe the, the numbers changed from last year, but I think it's up to $30,000 for a business. Um, so that's a tax credit on the installation costs. And the DOE programs, typically what they do is, although there's several programs, so we need to talk to the charging station vendors uh, to see which ones they're participating in. Um, but typically, they will provide the charger to you for free. And so it usually ends up with you just paying for installation, although there's even some cases where uh, they will pay for part of the installation too. Okay, did you have anything to add on that, Tom? Uh, no, I think uh, Chad covered the basics there. Okay, great. Well, I got a question for you then, Tom. Um, somebody's wondering what kind of protection uh, these stations need from the weather. Yeah, so there are different stations with different uh, characteristics. So uh, there are definitely a number of stations that are, are built to, you know, to sit outside in the rain and the cold and the heat and be just fine. And there are charging stations that have been installed in, you know, the heat of Southern California and heat and rain of Northern California for over 10 years and are going strong. So, you know, obviously I think you need to look at what your uh, potential vendors are supplying, but it's definitely very doable to make a charging station that can withstand the weather. Okay, got got another question here, Tom. Um, somebody was wondering about copper theft. We know there's a lot of heavy wire uh, used to, to run the circuit out to these uh, uh, stations. Uh, ever heard of uh, copper theft involving charging stations? Uh, it's, it's rare, but it has happened. 
So, uh, you know, as, as Chad mentioned in his slides, you want to think about the security of where you're installing the stuff. You know, a place that's in a dark corner that doesn't see a lot of traffic, I might be a little concerned. And a place that's uh, well lit and has, you know, a fair amount of traffic around it, it's going to be less appealing to copper thieves. Okay, Chad, we got a question for you. Uh, I think maybe while you were speaking, you uh, mentioned that EV owners may be hostile to a, a fee of greater than $2 for charging. Uh, is there some research to support that claim? Not research in the uh, typical meaning of the word, but uh, you know, certainly from following EV drivers online and uh, their comments, uh, we have seen a huge amount of people that feel that way. Now, I think this will change over time as new cars come out and they've got faster charging uh, and they're able to take on more electricity. The, the dollar amount will change and will go up, but I think right now the majority of them out there are leafs and volts, and if they're only taking 36 cents of electricity an hour and that pushes them 10 miles, you know, if you charge more than two, you're charging them more than gas. And there will still be people that need it that will still do it, uh, but there's going to be a lot of people that have hard feelings about it. Yeah, I know. I once used a station that was charging $5 per hour. Um, I just had to try it, though, <laughs> but not again. <laughs> Um, okay, somebody asked, who is they, and uh, they will restrict uh, you to 30 amps, and I think I know the answer. I think you're talking about the Department of Energy program? Correct. That was, uh, I, I have tried contacting people at the DOE to find out why they put this restriction on, but nobody will admit to being part of the process that led to this decision. I suspect what they were trying to do was uh, make the money go farther so they could put more charging stations in. And they figured it was differentiated between level two and DC fast charge anyway. So they figured they'd just go ahead and restrict the level twos. But um, obviously not everybody's covered by the DOE programs. And if you're buying the charging station on your own, you are not under that restriction. And uh, Clipper Creek uh, makes some extremely nice units uh, made in the USA and up to 75 amps. Okay. Uh, well, Tom, let's throw a question at you. Uh, somebody asked, does the uh, recent California legislation, AB 475, raise the cost uh, of putting in stations because it limits you to one EVSC per space rather than allowing sharing? Yeah, I think there's a pretty good argument for that. You know, uh, before that law, it was you know, you could put one charging station and have it be accessible from four different spots. And that means that maybe you don't have to restrict it to, to electric vehicles only. You can just count a normal turnover, leaving at least one of those spots open to an electric vehicle. And also it makes it possible for electric vehicles to share a charger. So I can drive up and plug in my leaf and then go watch a movie. And after an hour, maybe my leaf's full. And another leaf owner can notice that my car is done charging and then just move the charge cable over to theirs. Whereas if, uh, if there's only one spot per charger, then that, then that becomes possible. So, yeah, I think it, it uh, in some death cases, will definitely increase the cost required to get the same amount of utility out of a set of charging stations. Although I believe, I'm not from California, but I believe that law only applies in certain situations where you've got a certain type of sign up. So I believe it is possible for an installation to effectively not participate and not be subject to the law. That's correct. Okay, great. Um, well, let's move on here. We got some more questions. Um, Let's see here. Uh, Chad, uh, have you heard about any train trends in uh, the way people are charging at work? Uh, are employers charging for their employees to charge, <laughs> charging a monetary fee or giving it to them for free? What, what's, what's happening there? I wouldn't say trends. I'd say pretty much everything is being tried. Uh, I've heard of several employees giving it away for free. Um, some local employers here are uh, starting to charge. Usually it's pretty small amounts and, you know, it's, you know, a dollar an hour or 50 cents an hour. And I think 
in a lot of cases, you know, they're, they're trying to do two things. One is make sure people are only using it they really need it, so they don't have to install too many chargers. Um, and also just to address some of the concerns, some gas drivers are concerned that, you know, if you're not giving me gas, you shouldn't be giving this electricity away. Okay, I can see those points. Uh, also, uh, in just talking about this, we're using the word charge in two different senses, uh, charging a car or charging a, a monetary fee. Uh, how are we going to keep those disambiguated? Uh, in, in practice, uh, we, we have done so poorly is, is how we've typically done it. Um, I try and use the word fee uh, when we're talking about charging a fee, and charging is just too well embedded in electric vehicles to change that word, I think. Okay. Yeah, sometimes I try to... Go ahead. No, I, t I tend to, s to talk about uh, billing for charging, so that's, that's another way to disambiguate it. Yeah, same here, same here. Okay. Um, well, Tom, uh, somebody, I guess, was looking in the Nissan LEAF manual recently and found that there's a warning to not do more than one DC fast charge per day. And somebody also asked about the wear and tear on batteries of DC fast charging. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so for uh, lithium ion batteries, you do, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't want to charge at a rate that would give you a full charge in less than about two hours. And uh, clearly DC fast charging is charging at a faster rate since you can get an 80% charge in under a half an hour. So it does impose additional wear and tear on the battery. It may shorten the the lifetime of the battery if you use it a lot. I've heard mixed messages from Nissan. You know, when they were talking about it in 2009, uh, Mark Perry from Nissan said that uh, in their testing, they did tests that were equivalent to doing three quick charges per day, and it didn't affect the battery capacity uh, up through the seven-year mark, whereas the owner manual says don't do it more than once per day. So. I don't think we're, we, don't, we really know what's going on. I guess, you know, what I would say is if you need to make the occasional uh, long trip, I, w I, I wouldn't give it a second thought. Just go ahead and use the DC quick charging if it's available. On the other hand, if you're counting on using it every day for your daily driving, then uh, that's probably going to shorten your battery life. Okay, thanks. Uh, somebody else asked, do present EVs have an amp limit? even if you're charging a 75 amp station. And I think I kind of know the answer to that one. It, it, it's, it's like each car has its own built-in charger. We're talking about charging stations, which are really a way of delivering the power, but the charging circuitry is actually built into the car. And that charging circuitry is built to work with whatever size battery is, uh, is inside that car. So as was pointed out on, uh, on one of the charts, uh, a Nissan Leaf or a, uh, uh, Chevy Volt will typically at level two draw 15 or 16 amps and nothing more than that even if you have a 75 amp station available and uh, other cars that are capable of charging at a harder, higher rate will use those higher rates. Now if you have uh, a station that provides a lower rate uh, of current than the maximum charging rate of the car, uh, the car adjusts to that. The, the charging station actually reports to the car how much current is available on that circuit. And uh, so, in fact, the, the portable charger that comes with the Volt normally tells the car that there's 12 amps available. And, uh, and so the car knows, oh, draw that much and nothing more. And that's, uh, that's how the system works. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, do utility companies require disconnection uh, during peak demand. Oh my goodness. Uh, Tom, have you heard about that going on? Uh, no, you know, uh, utility companies, uh, you know, I've heard uh, Brian Farrell from Puget Sound Energy describe an electric vehicle as being about the same as a water heater. So in much the same way, they're not going to ask you to disconnect your electric water heater during peak times. They're not going to ask you to disconnect your electric vehicle. Now, in areas where energy at peak times gets very expensive to the utility, such as in Southern California, they will bill the user according to what time of day they're using the electricity, and so rates will be higher. But, uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard anything of utilities making you unplug a certain type of appliance during peak hours. 
Okay, thanks. Um, Chad, uh, somebody asks, why did it take so long to propose the U.S. Level 3 or D.C. Fast Charge standard? Probably because there were no U.S. automakers uh, trying to use it. Um, there's also some conspiracy theories going around, but I hate, hate to lend credence to any of them. Uh, nobody's really sure, but they, they are aware it needs to be done, and they appear to be working very hard at getting it done as fast as they can now. Cool. Cool. Well, I'm glad that's coming along. Uh, somebody else asked here, let's see. Um, oh, a local agency is uh, actually putting in a DC fast charging station, and uh, they're wondering if there's any gotchas to look out for. Who would like to take that? Well, I, th I think the biggest gotchas uh, are no, going to be in... I think most of them are going to be in the contract with the charging station provider. Um, who's paying for the charger? Who's paying for the installation? Who's paying for the electricity and maintenance? Who gets to keep it after the term is up if DOE is involved in this? Um, some of the contracts I've seen, pretty much all of the decisions uh, fall on the side of the charging station installer and the property owner really has very little say. They just basically give up some property for it, uh, but it may be different in different areas. Uh, this is so far being done uh, on a state-by-state -state basis, I think, and then inside each state they may be working on different uh, DOE programs or no program at all. So, you know, sorry to not be able to answer any better than that, but it, it really depends. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tom, um, what is the recommended signage, both street and off-street, for California? You know, specifically, I, I, I don't know, you know, I know what, uh, what Plug in America recommends, and that's basically the signs that uh, Chad showed, or the modified version, so that it has a plug instead of a gas nozzle, but uh, I'm not familiar with any specific California roads regulations. Okay, well I live in California and I'm sorry I don't know the regulations either, but uh, I do see that kind of sign being used at stations like we like we saw on the slides and uh, I found them to be fairly effective. Uh, and in fact I had even recommended uh, to one city that did not have signs on their stations that they just mail order the signs. They're available online. Uh, and so they informed me that they did. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, what else we have? Oh, somebody asked, uh, I've heard that level one charging is not good for your EV battery. Is that true? And well, I'll, I'll even try to answer part of this one. Uh, uh, I think actually level one, if, if you really mean level one, that is the 110 volt charging, uh, then th that's, that's actually one of the more comfortable ways to charge your battery. It's a gentler uh, way to charge. Uh, did I get it right, guys? There's a note in the Nissan LEAF manual that says that uh, level one charging isn't recommended as your primary charging method. And uh, I have it on pretty good authority that, that what you said is exactly right, that it's very nice to the battery, it doesn't cause any problem to the vehicle, and I suspect that the only reason that that's in there in the LEAF manual is so that, uh, you know, people aren't frustrated by the slow rate. Now, if you've figured out that your driving is, you know, only 30 miles a day and that level one would completely satisfy your needs, I, I you know, I don't think there's any reason not to, not to use level one for your charging method at home. And it has the advantage that, that uh, you've probably already got an outlet you can use so you don't have to spend any money on infrastructure, which is awesome. Okay. Uh, well, we have another California-specific question, and I don't know if we have the answer to this one. We may have to look it up for you. Uh, does California require at least one charge station in a group to be accessible by handicapped parkers? And I have not heard anything about that. Uh, have you guys heard anything? You know, I think that's just the federal I'm American. Not sure. Tom first. I, I, think... <laughs> I can take it. 
So I, I think the Americans with Disability Act pretty much cover that. If you're providing a service, it needs to be uh, handicap accessible. So I think the same would apply to uh, uh, charging stations. So I know we recommend that in a given installation, the first station that you put in should be accessible from handicap. It, you know, you could have. So I guess this is another problem with the California law. Ideally, in a small installation, I would recommend that somebody puts in their first charging station so that it straddles between uh, an ADA spot and a regular spot, and that way either sort of vehicle or user can use it. Uh, and then after that, then there are requirements for how many, what fraction of spots in a parking lot need to be handicapped accessible, and I think it, you need to follow that same guideline for electric vehicles, charging stations. Okay, well, uh, we still have quite a few questions, and I don't think we're going to get to quite all of them. We'll do a few more here, um, but we will. We are keeping a record of all these uh, questions, and uh, we'll go look through them. And the ones that we don't get to answer here, uh, we'll we'll get back to you. We'll email back uh, uh, the answers after we after we figure out what the answers are for you. But let's continue on with a few more questions while we're all still here. Um, Again, on the famous California AB 475, uh, does it mandate a specific sign mandating that the EV must be plugged in even if it is not charging? Uh, Chad, you remember the rule on that? I think the law only applies if there is a specific sign, but I don't think the sign is mandated. But yeah, if, if you are using the right signs and you are under the law's rule, uh, the car does have to be plugged in, and the, the law makes no mention of whether you're charging or not. It just it doesn't even say if it has to be an electric car. It just says you have to be plugged in. Right, it says you have to be plugged in for the purpose of charging, but it doesn't actually say what that means. So, for instance, you could be plugged in with a 12-volt trickle charger to charge your accessory battery, and you would meet the letter of the law. So that's one of the things that's messy about that law. Uh, somebody asks, uh, where can we purchase the various parking signs available? Well, I know we have at least one available through the PluginAmerica.org website. Uh, what are our other sources for signs, Tom? Yeah, so some people just order it from Plug in America. We find that a lot of municipalities already have some sort of sign vendor, so they just take the artwork from, from that sign or the other signs that appear in the PSRC document and have them made. So. Yeah, you know, either way it would work. And I think we mentioned PSRC a couple of times. That's Puget Sound Regional Council. And uh, Plug in America worked with that group to do uh, a study to help municipalities uh, roll out regulations. So there's a model ordinance that cities in Washington can adopt and a bunch of regulations that lay out uh, sensible requirements for how charging stations should be placed relative to parking spots. So if you had just do a web search for PSRC and electric vehicle model ordinance, you'll, you'll find a ton of really great information there. Okay, and somebody asks, what is level three? Who wants that I can, one? <laughs> yeah, I, I can take it. So. Uh, Sort of in the early days, what is now called DC fast charging was called level three. And the issue is that there's also talk of, uh, instead of a, a DC standard, also an AC standard that is being called level three. So I think level three is not, there's not currently a level three standard, so that term has sort of been, is no longer being used. It, there may at some point be an SAE standard for level three AC charging. But you know, right now DC fast charging is the is the only game in town in that area. Okay, and um, here's our our last question for the day, and then we'll then we'll wrap it up. Um, does anybody care to comment on selling uh, EVSE concept to high rise condo association? Uh, also, any implementation advice? <clears throat> Uh, I can take it. Okay. So I think it would be super smart for municipalities to require all new construction to at least run wires, conduits, whatever are needed 
for charging stations. It's so, it's so inexpensive to do that during construction, and it can be incredibly expensive to do it uh, as a retrofit. So, you know, I think that's the first thing that should happen. You know, beyond that, it's been very ad hoc so far. You know, every uh, apartment complex, condo association, whatever is different. So, you know, I know a number of electric vehicle owners who have been successful in getting uh, charging stations installed at, at uh, you know, condos and apartment complexes and others where it's, that, you know, they've run into roadblocks, either artificial roadblocks because condo associations are, you know, afraid of some new concept and also real roadblocks where it's just, uh, you know, incredibly expensive to run cables down through potentially multiple levels of parking garages and so that can be a real, a real mess. And actually we're fortunate, it, or people who live in California are fortunate that there was a law passed recently that basically stops condo associations for preventing owners from putting in charging stations without, you know, some real reason for, for not wanting those charging stations. Know, Chad, in, you want to add anything? In Vancouver, BC, uh, they have passed a law saying that for new buildings, whether it's apartments or condos, they have to have a certain percentage of them uh, with electricity supplied to the parking spots. And, you know, predictably the developers complained about, you know, all this extra money and raising the cost of buildings and things like that until they realized that those spaces could sell for a premium and now it's a money-making issue and they're doing way more than the number required by law. Um, I, I think it's an absolute no-brainer for new construction and as Tom mentioned for, you know, adding it to existing buildings is harder. I, I think the only consideration should be financial and how much it costs, but as long as the owner is willing to bear the costs, there's really no reason for any condo board to get in the way and say it can't be done. Well, thank you very much. And, um, well, we've run about 15 minutes over our original time here, but we did get quite a few questions answered. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. And we hope that you enjoyed this webinar and found the information useful. Uh, later today, you should receive an email asking you to take a brief survey. Uh, please uh, spend a few minutes filling out that survey so we'll have uh, a better idea of what you thought about the webinar and, and how we can improve our next one. Uh, so this concludes this webinar. And uh, please, everybody, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.